Hello and welcome to another episode of BWeb Decoded. I am your host for this week, Porter Stoll from the Filecoin Foundation. And with me is a very special guest, someone near and dear to my past, one of the OGs in the Web3 space, Mr. David Post. How are we doing today? Living the dream, man. Thanks for having me. Yes. So for those uh, within our community and audience who don't know who you are, who are you, Dave? Who am I? I ask myself that question every day. But uh, in terms of work, uh, you and I suffered together at IBM Blockchain, um, where I ran IBM Blockchain Ventures. Uh, and then I uh, led investments at Chainlink. And uh, most recently, I'm a co-founder for both Helix and for W3.io. What, what is Helix and what is W3.io? Helix is a Web3 advisory firm that focuses uh, only on the off-chain compute and deepen segments. So uh, we're two trick ponies. Uh, we like to, and we also do a third trick actually, which is ecosystem building. And W3.io is the uh, is, is Swift for decentralized compute. It's an industry consortium that's going to make uh, decentralized compute much more accessible and much more uh, effective at bringing workloads on chain at scale. Which is, I think, we'll, we'll talk a bit about what needs to happen for that to occur. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely want to put a pin to learn more about Web3, W3. Uh, so let's just dive right in. I know you've been in the space since 2017 with me. Yeah, that's yeah, it's weird, man. <laughs> you and I entered at the same time, uh, same year. Uh, again, we cut our teeth early on and the only corporate gig that blockchain had to offer. Uh, and so my first question is a popular one. Why did enterprise blockchain fail? I think enterprise blockchain failed for a couple of reasons. Uh, you and I were part of lots of the failed enterprise blockchain networks, and I think that's the most likely case for how blockchain will be adopted. Uh, when you think about the adoption of blockchain technology, it can either be a technology, which is what IBM and others tried to do and fail, selling permissioned uh, blockchain software, which wasn't a really great way of entering market because it doesn't help people solve their business problems in a substantially better way than they could otherwise. Um, you can consume blockchain services, which people do to build largely science experiments. So a lot of the POCs never get it into production. And then there's the blockchain networks, which I think is the most promising way for people like different entities to get involved with blockchain piece. It actually is a better way than transacting in a centralized fashion. But the reason why these things failed was, uh, I I think, for a number of reasons. First, uh, in terms of economic incentives, a lot of these were set up in a way that they weren't pie expanding. They effectively created distributive gains. So if you're in a network with someone and they're better off and you're worse off, it's difficult to bring people together. But I think technologically, the issue was is that the only thing you could do in 2017 and 2018 on private blockchain networks was audit and settle. And the reason why is because there was really no blockchain middleware. And uh, what like something like Chainlink was probably the first thing to emerge in the blockchain middleware stack. Now there's about 40 or 50 projects. And if you don't have blockchain middleware, you don't have an effective way of managing smart contracts because, as we know, smart contracts are actually very dumb. So if you, if you don't have the ability to kind of have trustless interactions between counterparties, you result in a situation where you effectively have to have everybody standardize their business processes one-to-one, and organizations don't like doing that. So the reason why enterprise blockchain networks fail is because they really didn't drive enough business efficiencies or technological efficiencies to make it really much better than transacting on centralized alternatives. So now we fast forward to 2024. We have Larry Fink coming out and talking about the tokenization of everything. We're seeing more enterprise interest across the board in a number of different use cases. What's going to be different this time around? And what are some of the things that were present in the initial, you know, uh, first iteration of enterprise blockchain that are going to make this different this time? So I think that there's two different value drivers here. I think that a lot of large enterprises have gone through the POC cycle and they understand that just because you put something on on blockchain doesn't make it substantially better. That's not enough. What blockchains are good for is multi-party transactions that require a high degree of trust and a high degree of automation. And you can get that on chain if you can get mileage out of your smart contracts. So I'd say one thing that's qualitatively different about this cycle is on the financial financial side. So uh, there's obviously a lot more participation here and there's a lot more people just interested in the asset class, but that alone is not gonna be sufficient to get people transacting on chain at scale. Because if you look at things like real world assets, right now there's not an integrated stack that makes managing real world assets on chain better than a centralized alternative. And that's where the tech side of crypto comes in, which is where you and I focus our time. Uh, I think that what's different about this cycle is that we now have 50 really strong blockchain middleware projects that can make it easier for people to do things on chain than they could off chain. 
And my thesis is, you know, you and I slog through corporate IT departments uh, trying to make sales there when we were when we were working uh, for IBM and other places. Uh, what I think is going to be the primary entry point for large enterprises to actually start transacting on chain is actually going to be through the IT department because decentralized compute projects and the ability to run business processes on chain with those decentralized compute projects will make it better, faster and cheaper than centralized alternatives. So the, the stack started coming out in like 2022. This is when a lot of these projects got funded. As I said before, there's kind of like 40 or 50 pretty interesting projects at a decent degree of maturity. And the question is now, uh, as a segment and as an industry, are, are we going to recognize that the primary way we're going to get people on chain is by allowing them to actually access better IT and get more out of their smart contracts? When we realize that, I think it creates the pie for everybody. So that's what I'm really excited about in this cycle is this, this particular segment, I believe, is critical for the future of the industry. And I think this segment is actually ready for prime time now. Nice. So you, you mentioned a couple of times there's about 40, 50 prime examples of really <clears throat> impactful middleware. What are some of your favorite examples uh, that represent like the, the progression in the space? So I think that you see that there's multiple good options per category. So uh, obviously Filecoin and Arweave on the storage side, you have Layer Zero, Chainlink, Axelar and Wormhole on the messaging side. If you're talking about GPU networks, you have Akash, you have Render, uh, you, you have uh, IO.net that's emerged as kind of an aggregator. Um, and then on the data side, you have like decentralized data warehouses like Space and Time. You have data pipelines like Ceramic. Uh, you have lots of good indexing options between like Covalent and, uh, and Zetablocks. So there's lots of good projects in each of these specific segments. And that's what's exciting here because you want to have a, a robust ecosystem. And I, I think that having these individually strong projects lays the basis for what I think is really the killer app here, which is an integrated way of using all of these things at once using smart contracts as the focus. So we basically got lots of really strong founders and it's an awesome, like the CEOs and the leadership teams for the, in the middle of our stack, really cool people, smart, intellectual. They want to build uh, you know, protocols that are gonna be vibrant communities. And they also wanna build tech that's gonna change the world. And that's a very powerful combination. And one that I, I, I think is really unique about this part of the stack is people are long-term thinkers and they're in it, obviously, for the financial upside, but they're also in it for the love of the game, which I think is a really good combination. I, you know, I love, I, I always love my time with David because you can feel the passion emanating from the screen. Very powerful. <laughs> and, you know, it's really, as you said, it's when you have a smart contracts that connect all these individual platforms together. That's where the, the real magic happens. Explain to our audience what that magic looks like compared to what we have as a status quo alternative today. Yeah, so basically, if you think about what Ethereum was, it was kind of like programmable smart contracts. So you can you, you can command something on chain to do something. And, and then uh, I think we're in a phase now where it's kind of instrumented smart contracts. So that means we have all of these individual off-chain compute resources that can be used to be managed as smart contract, but they're not at all speaking to each other. So you have an off-chain compute call coming into a smart contract from Filecoin, then there's another one that comes in from Chainlink, there's another one that comes in from Space and Time. So that doesn't make it efficient to run smart contracts as the basis for more complex forms of business processes. What we have the opportunity to do now is basically mimic the functionality that you have in a traditional cloud by making it so these off-chain compute projects can speak to each other. Uh, when we used to be at IBM together, we all, that's what they always say on the sales side of the house, people don't buy IT widgets, they buy business solutions. And if you want something better to happen on chain, that needs to involve lots of commands going into a smart contract. So if you have an orchestration layer, what that allows you to do, as I said, is mimic the functionality of a traditional cloud by instead of having one off-chain compute resource call one smart contract, you can have seven or eight different commands in one smart contract call. And that's super cool because then you begin to have all of these contemporaneous actions happening within a business process all at once. And that makes smart contracts better, which makes it more interesting for people to develop on chain, because if you can do all these things trustlessly, it becomes better than centralized alternatives. So that's why I, I think that the stack is kind of at an inflection point. We have the ability to get more out of our smart contracts on one hand. On the other hand, we have a decentralized tech stack that's emerging that stands on its own two feet against centralized alternatives, and that it's better, cheaper, and as secure. So I think that's the there's two vectors here in the decentralized compute stack that I'm particularly excited about. One is that an integrated approach can lead to more in, 
and better stuff on chain at a more degree of scale, more developers participating. The other is that we have a decentralized tech stack that's just a better tech stack in its own right. And over time, that can go after the multi-trillion dollar opportunity, which is competing with the large centralized cloud providers. All right. If you're watching from home, press pause, rewind the last two minutes, listen to the, what David just said two more times. And hopefully you're excited as we are about what the future looks like. Wearing your Helix hat for a moment, you're in a, in a Helix, you, you run an investment advisory firm, as you said. What are you seeing across the investor landscape when it comes to these themes and trends that you're actively participating in? I think the investor landscape is quite interesting right now. So um, <coughs> there's a lot of activity at A stage projects because a lot of investors want more proximate liquidity in this cycle. The seed market has started heating up in the last month. So there's a lot more entrance at seeds. So that's very healthy. So I'd say generally speaking, the fundraising environment is, isn't as bubblicious as it was in uh, you know first quarter of 2022, but it's a pretty good fundraising environment. I think there's lots of investment in infrastructure in our space. This is all the way from L1s and L2s through the middleware stack to stuff that's kind of at the top of the stack, like messaging protocols. Uh, I think that a lot of that infrastructure in and of itself, as I've said before, is not going to do a lot because it only solves one part of the problem. So what I think is happening right now is there's a lot of innovation technologically happening in the space. And I think that the venture community is supporting that. Uh, the question always comes to adoption. So how, how are people actually going to use this, both Web3 native and outside of Web3, just because it's better technology? And that really requires an integrated approach, or you can't do it, right? It, it, does, it doesn't make sense to, uh, if you're powering a blockchain-based game that needs lots of different things to have reward someone within a metaverse, you want to come to that end user with a better decentralized stack that involves on-chain data, that involves off-chain data, identity, security, generative AI, so you can make the game respond to people uh, who are using the game. Similar in real world assets. Uh, if you want to do real world assets cross chain, you need messaging, but you also need things like identity and security. And once again, generative AI, you might want to run that on decentralized GPU network. These things aren't really possible right now. And until they're possible, I think we're going to be stuck in terms of blockchain adoption in the doing these science experiments in the innovation department, as opposed to seeing more mass migration on things around like real, real world assets that should be able to be more efficient on chain than on the alternative. So, you know, when I break down what I'm hearing, I do get a sense of a chicken or the egg problem. On the one hand, the chicken <clears throat> is the investors and trying to find product. They're investing in these individual single component parts of the ecosystem. But, you know, that can only be so impactful until the ecosystem itself is maturing and grabbing enough adoption to make the whole pie compelling. Because as you said, where you compete with, really compete with the hyperscalers, public cloud or central alternatives is when you have this ecosystem. So, you know, you and I have talked about this at length, but what is the key to building a good ecosystem that can get these individual components to be greater than the sum of its parts? So this is a very, uh, as you know, a topic I like to, to rant about on our, on our call. So let, let me start kind of high level on ecosystems and I can talk specifically about the Web3 middleware stack. So generally speaking in our industry, people conflate business development and ecosystem. So the way I would describe it is business development is a set of in-quarter activities that you have to get to go sign up a specific user group around the protocol that you're building. Ecosystem is a much longer game. And ecosystem is, where, where do we want to be three years ago? What are the metrics that matter for us? And let's build backwards. So there's a number of different components or facets to, to a healthy ecosystem function, in my, in my view. Um, number one is that someone who, like people involved in that function, have a high degree and expertise to advise founders in a very high touch type of way. So in any ecosystem, the way that you grow is by attracting good projects that are successful, that you can then use to attract more good projects that are more successful, that then go so on and so forth, attract more and more projects. So one is that uh, ecosystem functions need to like create a surface area so for as a basis for future success. So that's number one. I think number two, uh, you have to have a very clear vision as an, of an ecosystem on what you want to do. So when I was running uh, ecosystem investments at Chainlink, I had what I call the money slide. And this was basically my viewpoint on what would be required for the Chainlink network to be successful three years from now and a set of various components that I could point to when I was talking to investors and other external stakeholders about where I was spending my time and what projects were important to me and therefore what projects should be important to them. So there's something about good ecosystems that are very deliberative. They know where they're going 
and they can clearly ex uh, articulate that to both external and internal stakeholders. And then the third part is you have to be playing, uh, you know, playing to play as opposed to playing to win. So a good ecosystem function has lots of different relationships with lots of different people. Most of those relationships aren't yielding anything from a business perspective in the short term. You're playing to play. So whether that's with a uh, venture capitalist, potential strategic partnerships, uh, it's being in a situation where you're building relationships for the long run, because that's the thing about ecosystems, right? You don't know when you're going to need a specific relationship or when someone is going to be helpful for you. So that brings me to point number four, go to ecosystem functions, give first. So it's not only being helpful because you're going to give something to me back. It's not only being helpful because you're hundred percent going to be built here uh, within the ecosystem It's being helpful to be helpful. Uh, and that's the end game here. It's not about trading something. It's about having a reputation for being a function that's helpful for people over time. So how does this translate into what I think about the, the middleware stack? Uh, very similar types of principles. Uh, the interesting thing, if you bring all these middleware providers together is that uh, they're okay being in a structure or an ecosystem where there's competition, where there's multiples per category, because I think people who understand technology understand what we talked about before. People don't buy a piece part, they want an integrated solution. So if we're starting on the adoption curve within Web3, we need to be generating a lot of value to users within the Web3 within the Web3 world uh, from a technological standpoint and an end user functionality standpoint that will steer some of that billion dollars that's being spent by Web3 native companies on centralized IT services towards a decentralized middleware stack. And it's also understanding like ecosystems is where your ecosystem starts and stops. So L1s and L2s are very important for distribution of the decentralized compute stack. So there needs to be a structure by which all these people can get to the table and be part of the table. And if there is a robust ecosystem uh, and there's a project like W3 behind that, the treasury is used to then facilitate pie expanding exercises. So that's what it's kind of back to the future Porter started with these enterprise blockchain networks in 27, 2017, 2018 structure, very similar to how we're thinking about what's necessary for a robust web three middleware segment. It's, it's kind of like the industry's first, it's not an enterprise blockchain network, but it isn't a true industry consortium whose objective is to expand the pie. Yeah. So you have your theory, you're putting your theory into action, uh, and you're actually investing your time and resources into an example of orchestration and middleware where you think you can make a real difference. So let's talk about W3 and how this represents all the themes that are important to you uh, from an ecosystem perspective uh, and creating like this you know, the, the individual parts are greater than uh, an aggregate. How yeah, so I, I, it, how yeah, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, when you and I were working together on the earliest enterprise blockchain networks, it wasn't in my mind that this would be a theme that you'd be talking about on this podcast uh, seven or eight years later. So I, I think it's interesting how things to go, come together in your career. And for me, it's really driven by a motivation that I do believe that it's a very unusual chance you have that we have in our industry to build a more tra a better transaction layer, a more equitable transaction layer. And what motivates me is that, and I think that people who found things have to believe that, I think this is an absolutely critical and necessary part of the component, part of the equation. It cannot happen unless something like this exists. And that that's the driving motivation here is to um, basically bring things together in a way that's going to have a meaningful impact on the people that we work with who are network partners, our L1 and L2 partners, and people who are working collectively to build this better transactional layer. So the, the motivations are, uh, I think that the best founders are ones who are in it for the love of the game. Uh, and, I, and I think that's very much how uh, I view this. This is something that we felt was necessary for our advisory portfolio and just necessary for the industry to scale. And it's great to be working on something that really, where you really feel like you have an impact. And of course, we bring in the things that we think are important in terms of how you treat people, how you build a community, uh, not just in terms of members, but in terms of like, you know, enterprise members as well, in addition to community members. So it, it's just funny how things kind of come together. And uh, it's, all, you know, what, one of the big uh, takeaways I had from working in IBM Smarter Cities business, um, which is before or my life before the blockchain group, was it, oftentimes it's just, it's, it's pretty simple how things change in the world or in a city or something like that. It's group of people sitting around the table agreeing that there's a better way to do something and then executing on that plan. So that's what excites me about what's happening just within the, the blockchain middleware space right now. And specifically what we're spending our time on is I think that that critical mass is forming. And once it forms, I think it's going to be very powerful. All right. One more question, then I'll let you get out, get out of here. You set the table, so you're going to have to dog food your own uh, advice. I'm down, man. Let's do it. 
What does the future look like three years from today? Go. Uh, okay. Three years from today, I think that um, there will be more activity on chain. I think it's probably still going to be more on the financial side of things. So my prediction is an increase in enterprise particip uh, participation on financial use cases. And that will be powered in part by an integrated stack that they're able to consume. Um, in addition, I think that there will be initial signs and adoption out of corporate IT departments on the decentralized middleware stack. So I, for me, the financialization aspect and the price of crypto pri crypto prices is, is, is a nice thing, but it's not where I spend most of my time thinking. Uh, if we look at progression and what we'd want to see towards making this a better transactional layer, it's having more enterprise participants doing real things on chain powered by a robust tech stack. And it's also that the decentralized tech stack is starting to penetrate corporate IT departments. Because if you're already running on a decentralized tech stack that's pointed at smart contracts, it's just better. It's not a huge leap then to architect things on chain based upon that tech stack. Yeah, I'll augment that by my, my point of view is that all digital assets of value will be on chain within three years. And the orchestration layer that you're referring to will be the primary reason why people make that switch is because that's where value can be maximized and realized from those assets living on chain. Exactly. It has to be better, right? You have to help people make money or save money. And it has to be an IT stack that's ideally cheaper, definitely uh, as performant and definitely as secure. So if you can do those things, that's an incentive to start doing things differently and better. Where can people find you on the, on the interwebs, David? That's a great. Uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best one. I know I'm a bit, maybe a bit. Uh, I guess I guess wouldn't say boomer, but uh, not, not tremendously active on social. So if you want uh, want to chat or discuss something, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I tend to respond a lot on that one. All right, you're the best. Great catching, right, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you.